good to have all these wonderful testimonies. Love that. Testimonies are God's glorifying messes. Right? Our messes, he just glorifies them into amazing testimonies. That's good stuff. So, um, how many of you are ready for today? <laughs> really? <laughs> Okay, I want to. Uh, what I want to talk about today is um, I, I really sense there's um, uh, there is a move of God that is uh, undeniable. I really believe that. I sense that. I feel that. And I think um, there's also a lot of um, as we're moving in this direction, um, we find that. And I always put it this way: um, when you're in the jungle and you're just on a path, you're not going to have any opposition. But when you want to go trek through wherever the direction God tells you. You're going to have to somehow trek through real thicket, okay? And I feel like sometimes it is that way, that you're going through real thick stuff right now. And you feel like your arm is tired, you feel like your legs are all bitten up, your mosquitoes are all over the place, and you go, when are we there? <coughs> and I believe that it's just by, part of what it does to build our character. And um, I don't know if I'm good at uh, putting the, uh, the topics for today, but I want to put out the... the the theme for today is uh, what will it cost to really um, walk in a supernatural lifestyle? What will it cost? And are we ready for the cost? Because if you really want to know the truth, everybody likes to have the supernatural lifestyle. We, we all throughout um, history, we like the superheroes. We like Superman, he can kick everybody else out, and you know, Batman, and all the kind of stuff, Wonder Woman. We come up with all these superheroes, and we love them because they can do all this kind of stuff. And if you really are uh, honest about yourself, if you've had these dreams about flying, you know how many have had these dreams that you fly, and you can just do anything, nothing is impossible? We love that. But sometimes we just get up in the morning, and we kind of feel like, I'm not sure if I can do or handle life, or can do life, or have actually what it takes to do life because I don't like this and I don't like this and somehow by the time we wake up and by the time we are in the bathroom we're like okay we're already down and I'm wondering what is it that it counts the cost and what happens if we would really count the cost and most of us I think we have this idea that if I count the cost okay God wants all my money he wants all my time and I have to go to church all the time and I have to just, um, you know, do what he tells me to do. And I think if, we, if that's our process of counting the cost, then we really don't understand anything the Bible actually talks about. And I understand we interpret, well, uh, pick up your cross and follow me. But there's so many other things that I actually explain what that means. And so I want to walk through a couple of these things, and I want to walk through the be, uh, the, one of the bare necessities of actually counting the cost, and I want to just introduce this tonight, um, obeying him in matters of forgiveness and judging. I believe part of um, what we're living in is a, is a seal or is a ceiling that we're not moving away from because our judgment and unforgiveness and bitterness that we carry. We don't even, we're not even knowledgeable about all the judgments that we carry. All the negativity that we carry. All the things that actually don't align with God's word at all. But we just made them a part of our life. I'm just not that smart. I'm not just that. And we, we have ways how to talk down. We have ways how to talk about everybody else. And then we wonder why God cannot do miracles. We wonder why God is not doing anything. Because we don't understand that every single word that we actually say is actually, actually brings life or breeds death. And I want to put it out a little bit blunter than that. Everybody knows that when light is established, light, it actually, to this day, the light that God created is still traveling at 300,000 miles per second. And somewhere down there, I don't know where we can find it. But we all know the universe is expanding. So somehow that light, and so any word, and everything, you and I have a sound. And we have to figure out that what we're saying, what we're speaking, is actually influences our sphere. It influences what we do. And the Bible is so clear about it, but I don't think we get it. 
I think most of us, we read it and we go, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay, no wholesome talk, yeah, okay. But really, what does it look like? And I want to just be able to communicate that is that forgiveness and judging is a big deal. Forgiving people wholeheartedly and not judging is a big deal. And being available is another thing. Being available when God speaks. And I'd like to propose to you that God is speaking. This is a season of when God is speaking. And the question is, are we willing to do whatever it takes to hear, to listen, or to make ourselves available? Are we ready to say, God, if you're going to speak at 4 o'clock in the morning because that's the only time I have, I'm going to actually start talking to you and waking up. I'm going to set my alarm for 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, but that means I'm going to have to go to bed at 7 or at 8. Are we willing to live the radical life that God actually created us to do because the, the assignments that he's given us are that big? So if I'm going to become a doctor, the assignment of me being a doctor, I will have to go to school. I'll have to learn stuff that I've never learned before. I'm going to have to cut people open. I have to do all this kind of stuff because at the end, I'm going to do the real thing. And let me tell you, building the kingdom of God is so much more than becoming a doctor or anything else, a rocket science or whatever else takes longer. So the question is, are we actually taking living a life are we ready to count the cost of living the life that God has called us to do? God has purposed us to live. The identity that God has imprinted on us. Are we ready to say whatever it takes? That's the burning question. And I believe if we don't have the answer to that, then we're really not engaging in and we can't really expect the heavens over us to open up. And the only way it's going to open up is if we actually start measuring what we forgive and what we judge in our availability. If we're not ready to interact with God, if we're not ready to somehow put ourselves into this place where we say, you know what? This is what I want to do. Now I want to say something, and it may not be very popular, but I believe it's the truth. And I want to make it a little bit more personal to this church because you can do this to any place. It wouldn't make a difference where. According to the destiny that God has for you, you're going to find opposition. The Bible calls it warfare. And there is people in any church, wherever you are, in the kingdom of God, there's people in this kingdom and there's people in this church, they're having opposition just because you're here. Let me put it a little bit different. The reason why you're having opposition is because God has chosen me to do something extraordinarily great. And I can't do it by myself. I can only do it with every one of you. And because the calling and the, what God has called us to do is so great... That's why you and everybody else, staff and everybody else around me, is actually having issues with warfare, are being attacked up and right down side the other, because he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I can make sure that everybody else doesn't do, then they fail. And then what happens is that there is going to be things that are going to come against. And next thing you know, people are going to leave the church. And that's great. And guess what they say? I've heard it now many times. I've been in ministry for 30 years. Guess what I say? Well, as soon as I left the church, everything was easy. I mean, everything was fine. I could sleep again. I was totally fine. I'm not angry. I'm not frustrated. I'm not anything. Everything's fine. Everything. Happy, happy, Jojo. Joe. Of course it's going to be okay. Of course your life is going to be golden for a while. Why? Because the enemy was actually tormenting you because he didn't want you to be a part of what, he, what God is doing. Are you hearing that? So don't be surprised when you follow what God has called people to do and we are a team together following. Of course we're going to be having warfare. Of course we're going to have opposition. But that's normal. But if we know that, 
then we need to ask ourselves, how do we press through that? How do we go against that? How is it that we, that, you know, you have some amazing moments. You have amazing words that God speaks. And the moment he speaks, it, it's totally going the opposite direction. And you go, what on earth? And then you have to bridle your tongue because or else you're going to start putting caps on people, caps on yourself. You're going to start telling things about And that's what the enemy thrives on because when you no longer are getting blessing is because you probably said something against yourself. Because you actually probably cursed yourself. And I, I wouldn't call it cursing, yeah? But if I say I'm dumb, I, I'll never do it. Now, that's never going to be me. I think I'm giving up. This is enough. I can't do this anymore. What are you saying? You're just, you're, you're just agreeing with everything that the enemy says. Right? So counting the cost is really about what do I believe about me? What do I believe? And what is normal by count, by, when I'm in building kingdom mentality and kingdom building uh, lifestyle, then what is normal? Attacks, opposition, is normal. You can walk away from that. And then your life is going to be maybe happy a little bit more but let me tell you all the things that I have to go through by the time I live in eternity because I'm going to live to be 120 years old at least I have a lot of things to say that, when, that God has done through me or at least I've done a lot of prep work for the other people to do it and it doesn't matter if I ever get to see one of them or not because Abram didn't get to see all the nations and all the sands and the seashore he didn't see he just saw his one son and I want to encourage you today that we live not for the now, we live for eternity. We live to do and build the kingdom of God. That's what we're here for. And the counting the cost is to say, I'm not going to be judgmental. And I'm not going to, because that actually holds me back. And it puts a cap on people and puts a cap on what my ministry and what my influence is. Every time I don't love but I judge, I'm actually solidifying them into their misery. Because I no longer have influence. Every time I hold on bitterness, I'm no longer going to be able to love them. And I no longer have influence. And every time I'm not available, the Bible says that hearing, uh, faith comes by hearing the word of God. If I'm not obedient, nobody's going to hear anything. And remember, God can do this all by himself, but he chose not to. God said... I. I can do this all by myself, but I'm choosing to create people in my image to do that job. That's ours. So I believe that there's plenty of stuff to do here in the kingdom of God in Stratford. Plenty. And the enemy is doing one thing, trying to do whatever he can to somehow get you out of that place. And you have to wake up and say, okay, this is not going to happen. I don't care what happens, but one thing is not going to happen. I'm not going to walk away from my destiny. I'm not going to walk away from what God has for me. I'm surely not going to walk away from that. Because all I know is that this is my destiny. This is where God has put me. And no matter how my feelings are, but if I am in accountability, people are going to help me through my hard times. So this is what Christ himself says in Colossians 2, uh, verses 2 through 7, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may be, have full riches and complete understanding. That's a huge word, that they have full riches and understanding. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart. Our desire is to encourage in heart, not to judge or hold bitterness. You still here? You have to really process that what am I judgmental against? Well, let's, let's deal with the workplace. Let's deal with people in your own home. Let's deal with your spouse, with your kids. With whatever. What am I judgmental against? What do I manage people's thoughts about? What is it that I'm still harboring? Why am I still can't see this person? Why can't I still have a conversation with that person? Why am I not still connecting with that person? What am I holding bitterness against? Forgiveness doesn't mean that I give the other person the right to be what they are in a sense that I call it right. It just says that I'm no longer going to hold it against you. I'm setting myself free. I'm cutting that link off. 
my purpose, Paul says, is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may be, have, a full, have the full riches of complete understanding. What is that about? It's understanding who God is. When I understand who God is, that he didn't come to judge but to save the world, not to condemn but to save the world, then I can no longer be the one. So counting the cost for me is I'm no longer, I will actually bridle my tongue in any judgment that I have. I will not say and speak anything in the negative realm. And there, I'm not going to, I'm going to fast negativity from now on. I'm going to fast negative things, negative thoughts. I'm not going to speak them out. I'm going to speak the opposite. And people are going to look at me, you are so naive, you're so stupid, you're so whatever. And I say, that's fine because I know what I'm doing. I'm speaking life. Because I want the full riches of the complete understanding in order that they may know the mysteries of God. God wants to reveal mysteries to us, but He can't reveal mysteries if all we do is judge and be are bitter and not available. Are you with me? In order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God wants to give you the treasures of wisdom of knowledge. He wants to give them to you. Do we have time to listen? Do we have time to invest? Do we have time to look? I'll tell you this so that no one may be deceived by fine-sounding arguments. That is so important because it actually says that there's fine-sounding arguments that may look like what God is saying is not good. That earthly wisdom will sometimes look so much more tangible than actually the supernatural. Because the supernatural would mean I have to trust. And that what I'm explaining so beautifully and eloquently is actually what earthly wisdom would look like. And I go, well, that looks actually more tangible tangible but actually the spiritual man doesn't go on earthly processes but the spiritual man goes on that what is impossible is possible with God and that's my core value that's how, how I function and the enemy will always bring you down to the bottom line and you say I don't have a bottom line my bottom line is Christ so I tell you this that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments Fine sounding arguments in a different translation, the Marcus translation means it's earthly wisdom. Fine sounding arguments basically means throw faith out the window and put earthly wisdom in there. It wouldn't make sense. Everybody else will tell you that God doesn't make sense, but God makes more sense than all. For I am absent from you in body, it says, but I'm present in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are now and firm in the faith. And that's the beautiful part is we can be absent, but we're in present in the Spirit because we pray in the Spirit we're connected. I want to read something in, um, in Zechariah chapter 3, and I think that's important. I'm going to put the iPad on because it's larger print. Ch Zechariah chapter 3, and I want to put this out there. Because I believe this is part of counting the cost. In Zechariah chapter 3, it says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And I felt what the Lord gave me the scripture a couple, um, maybe a week ago. He said to me, That's exactly how all of you are standing. There's a courtroom in heaven where you are, and the enemy is constantly accusing you. And it says, He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And this is what it says, The Lord said to Satan, The, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. He didn't cuss at him. He didn't call him names. Hello? That's like a little kid calling you names, and you call him names back. There's, there's honor in everything that God does, and there's honor in the way we fight our battles. And so there's part of that, and he says, The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? 
That sounds very New Testament-like, doesn't it? <laughs> a burning reed I will not deny, right? So he understands, in, in, in paraphrase, he is the man who actually is dead because he, passed, he is sinful, but I am the one who snatches him. I'm the one who snatched him from the fire. And then this is what he says. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes with sin, right? And he stood before the angel. That's the accusing mantle. And then he says, the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I've taken away your sin, and I'll put rich garments on you. That is what God has done with us. Don't ever, 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 ever partner with the thought that the enemy wins. He doesn't. He just may look like he's winning, but he always loses. And then he said, I put a clean turban on his head so they may put a clean turban on his head. And he clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. Then it says, verse 6, the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. I love this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among these standing here. He is standing in the heavenly realms, in the heavenly courts. Are you still with me? He's standing in the heavenly realms. He's not standing on earth. He's standing in the heavenly realms. And God says, if you do these things, you will stand among these people. That means you're actually invited into the courtroom of heaven to start giving verdicts and decrees out. Everybody's like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, but it says, this is what the Lord says, if you walk in my ways and keep my requirements. In other words, let me put it bluntly. If we walk out what destiny and purpose God has for us, we will be able to stand in the courtroom of God. Yeah. And we can read the verdicts and we can be in that place. No, you don't have to just live in Stratford. You can actually visit the kingdom of God. You can actually visit the heavenly places. You can actually go into the courtroom of heaven. That is what is prepared for us. Listen, O high priest Joshua and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come. Hello, that's us. Everybody excited? You can shout, do a dance, whatever you want. You don't have to be all like quiet, okay? It's not like I'm the only loud one here. So, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. That's what Jesus. See the stone I've set in front of you, Joshua. So I want to say this because I feel like it's important that we understand. We have access into the heavenly realms. The question is, do we believe that or we just think that's freaky? We have access into the heavenly realms. That's what Joshua got, and we are priests. That's what the Bible calls us. Ephesians talks about something beautiful. Ephesians actually gives us the ability. Ephesians 1.17 says, I keep asking that the Lord, that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Well, where do you think you get that from? You get that from the heavenly places. So we are not these people who don't know what to do, but we have solutions. We have mighty solutions to any problem, anything that exists there, and we may have to be patient, but yes, we will get those answers. But this is the most important. It's not the answers, but that, that we may get to know Him better. So this is the thing. The closer we get to know Him, the more we get to know Him, the less we're worried about what's happening. In other words, if I would have known Jesus as much as I knew him after Lazarus, because, yes, it's going to be okay, right? Uh, I don't have time right now, but uh, I'll get down there. So I like that because Jesus said he's going to come. So my thought is no longer going to be that Lazarus is going to die. My thought's going to be that Lazarus is going to be fine because Jesus said he's going to come. I don't know how you interpret it, but that's how I interpret it. When God says, I, I, I'll, I'll be there, I, I don't have to worry about anything. But then, guess what happened? He died. So I don't know if you noticed that, but I've noticed that a lot of times when God promises something, it all goes a different direction. Anybody agree with that? God says, okay, I'm going to promise you this. I'll help you a little bit. 
Abram, you're going to be the father of all nations. Uh, you have no kids. What? What is up with this? Makes no sense. David, you're going to be king, anointed king. You have this great moment with Elijah, with, with Goliath, and next thing you're 14 years on the run. I thought I was supposed to be king. What are you talking about? Now, you know many other places in the Bible where it talks about these things, but just look at you. Look at all the promises and the fights we're having. God says we're going to double by the end of the year, and it always goes the opposite direction. So what are we doing? We're fighting. We're believing what God said. It ain't making no difference. Because I don't know where else to go. I believe this stuff. I have no idea where else to go. I just know we're doing this. Well, what if? I don't know what if, but I have nowhere else to go. Are you still here? Yeah. Right? So then I may know him better. It's so important that I get to know him because when I know him, then, he knows, then I know what's going on. Actually, he's just building my character. Actually, God is timeless. So when he says, I'm always faithful, I'll never leave you or forsake you, my promises all are yes, and they're all amen, that's what he means. So for him, a thousand years is like an hour, or like a day, or like a second. I don't know what it is, but I can tell you that if I have to wait 20 years, that's like peanuts to him. Because all it's doing, he's creating me, he's maturing me to the place that I can carry the anointing. I can carry the holiness. I can carry the things that he's called me to do. If not, he would crush me with it, and I wouldn't be able to take it. He's never late. He's never late. So Ephesians talks about that. So that you may know him better. I pray that your eyes and your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which he called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance. I mean, that is, I mean, that's the best testament you have. I mean, if somebody dies, that's what they should write. Um, you are suckered full of the stuff. I mean, it's like osmosis. I mean, this is great stuff. And we're still alive. And we get it. And it's incomparably great power for us who believe. We're going to get great, uncomparable power. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which exerted in Christ when he raised the dead and seated him. We have resurrection power in us. Do we own that? We have resurrection power in us. We have the power of Christ in us. What's the cost? I'm not going to judge. Jesus didn't come to judge and condemn the world, but he came to save the world. He so loved the world. So why am I judging? They're just like this. Or they're like this. Or, well, this is what they are. Was, yeah, they look like this, and they're this. That's judging. Or you start talking negative about yourself, and you wonder why God's not doing anything in your life anymore. And you wonder why. It's because you partner with the accusation of the enemy. And we need to repent. I'm no longer saying that about me. God, when I said these things, tell me what I said. Show me what I said about me. That, that why, why I dried up. Where did I curse my own self and put a cloud over me so there's no sunshine? We many times think it's everybody else, but actually sometimes, a lot of times, it's us. We, 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 we. We say things that are so detrimental to our actual calling and destiny that we actually curse ourselves. And we boohoo because it's just raining over us all the time. <laughs> it's just rain, rain. Well, shove the cloud away. <laughs> and it's just raining. Well, you, you just go like this and just stop it. But many of us don't even know what we said. Maybe it's a good idea to go back home and say, God, what are the things that I said over me that makes my life a desert? that makes my words no longer speak and flourish, makes my river no longer go. Because if the dam is closed over here, I can speak all I want. Nothing's coming. Because I've created judgment over myself. Yeah. But I carry bitterness, and it just, that doesn't allow anything to flow anymore. Yeah. I'm saying the things, but it's dry. 
My life is dry instead of full of life. Are you still with me? I love it that he says, and I don't want to continue on reading all this because, yeah, well. Whew. I believe that the Lord, when he's there in heaven, there's a verdict. The verdict that came to Joshua was, you're burning stick, take your dirty clothes off, I'm going to give you clean. I'm going to perturb them on you. I'm going to give you payback. We are capable of going to the heavenly realms into the courthouse and say, God, I want to know what the verdict is for me. I want my verdict. And I want payback. Because I've been wrongly accused. Because you have forgiven me. You, have, you, have, you took the punishment. I no longer have to be punished. I'm no longer being punished. I am no longer being punished. I no longer receive that. I'm no longer going to speak that over me. I'm no longer going to take all this kind of stuff. I'm no longer believing that. I believe that I'm free, that I'm no longer punished, and I want to have that verdict. I want to believe that verdict. What was the verdict about my life? I want to know what my verdict is. Because when I have the verdict, I can walk out of the courtroom, and I'm totally free, and I can do what you've called me to do. Are you here? Gosh, you guys are so quiet. Like, am I yelling at you? I'm sorry for yelling. I believe in this particular instance, you see Joshua standing there, and he thinks he's so, he's so cocky, Satan standing there, and goes, yeah, what did you do with him? And Satan overplayed his hand. Satan overplayed his hand with Jesus. Satan overplay, overplayed his hand with you. He overplayed his hand. He thought you were dead. He thought you were, he stole your vision. He thought he can do it to you. But you know what? You have resurrection power in you. You have resurrection power in you coming, shooting up from the bottom up. And there you are. Matthew 13 gives you some amazing truth. And I'm not sure how much we believe this stuff too. Because the knowledge in Matthew 13 verses 10, the disciples came to him and asked him, why do you speak to the people in parables? You see, we like to God just goes, just tell me what to do. How many of our times have I heard this? Just God, tell me what to do. God says, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide it for you. Ah, that's too much work. What are you talking about hiding for you? You know, we like looking for Easter eggs, right? Yeah. And then God, it, 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 I mean, this would be, it'd be a really mean parent who if you have a toddler of two or three years old and you put something on top of the refrigerator, they'll never find it. But they'll put it right in the middle in front of a room and the, the little toddler goes, I don't know, where is it? Where is it? Oh, there it is! And they feel like they found the gold mine. That's what God is doing because he doesn't want to just give it to you because you wouldn't value it. And so this is what he says. And he said, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you. Do we understand the concept of that? Yeah. I don't. I'm glad you do. But I feel like because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, that means... He's consistently giving us secrets and revelations. That means dreams and visions are still coming. They're not, God is unsearchable. So whatever he gave unto this moment is still not all of it. There's so much more coming. And he hasn't revealed everything that is coming yet. And God wants to, he wants us to search him. He wants us to know who he is. And I don't think nobody's here that says, I know everything about God and who he is. So the truth is, I want to get to know you. Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom, that is so important. You have been given the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom. That's a beautiful part. So how many of us want to find out what that all is? We'll spend a lifetime and eternity still finding that out, and we still never get to the end. How amazing is that? 
the secrets of the kingdom have been given to you. That means you and me. The good news is that you can restore what was lost. And the good news is that we can start valuing the dreams, valuing the visions, valuing what God is doing, how God speaks to us. Because he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdoms of heaven has been given to you. That means he speaks in parables, he speaks in dreams, he speaks in visions. He does that. So how does he do that? I want to invite you into this place. He does it through opening the heaven. Heaven cannot be opened when we curse ourselves and we don't act the way God acts. That, heaven cannot be opened underneath that. But heaven can be opened by you. This is what the Lord says. The Lord in Deuteronomy 28. The Lord will open the heavens, the stores of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season, to bless all the works of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but you will borrow from none. That's the promise he gave to them. If you enter the land and you do the things, he says, I will open the heavens. So righteous living opens heaven. We have the power given by God to open heaven wherever we go. Well, not for me. Okay, another one. Luke 3.21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too, and he was praying, and heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended. Well, that was Jesus. Yeah, but you and I are his brothers and sisters. There's no difference. Hello? He loves us just as much as he loved Jesus. Right? Well, here's Stephen. Stephen. Acts 7, 55, 56. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up into heaven and saw the glory of God. He's being stoned, and, he, and God gives him an open heaven. How amazing is that? Acts 10, 11. Peter. And he saw heaven opened, and something came down. In Ezekiel, heaven's opened up. In Revelations, heaven's opened up. In Kings 19, the Mount of Olives, the heaven's opened up. You and I, the Bible is full of scripture where the heaven's opened up. You and I are empowered to open heaven. It's not something that God just does, but it's something that we can actually start doing when we don't judge and we forgive and we're starting to become available. When we actually become like Christ, heaven opens. We need to clear our spiritual atmosphere over ourselves and create that open heaven with God. We have to clear the spiritual atmosphere. Just clear it. There's so much gunk. Just start clearing it. There's so much aggravation, some antagonism, sometimes all this stuff, jealousy, accusations, all that stuff is there. Clear it out. You are empowered to clear it out. You don't have to come underneath that broadcast. You can say, I'm not, I, that is not me. I don't think like that. I don't have those thoughts. No, that's not me. I'm coming up from underneath it, and this is what I'm about. I can say that I have the power. Why? Through Christ, I have the power to do that. I'm no longer partnering with that. I don't partner with anybody who speaks like that. I have to clear the atmosphere. To the point that you can have an open heaven all the time around you. You don't have to go to certain places, which is fine. If you go to certain places where there's an open heaven, that's fine. You go to a prayer house, there's an open heaven there. Why? Because we worked at it. We're not judgmental. We, don't, we, we really try to sanctify that place. We try to sanctify our lives too, but that's a place where we have an open heaven. I believe we have an open heaven here because when people come in here, they sense the presence of God. It's not just because our air conditioning is good. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Once we understand how God speaks, 
we can actually begin to open heaven wherever we are. Once we understand how he works, once we understand who he really is, once we know him better, we can open heaven. I guess I'll teach on that on next Wednesday. Things that hinder on hope in heaven and clearing the spiritual atmosphere. I want to finish with this. Counting the cost. And I wanted to just basically bring those three issues up. That forgiveness is a big deal. Forgiving others and forgiving yourself closes heaven over you. Because it basically says that Christ's sacrifice wasn't enough. Being judgmental means that you put yourself over God that you know better. And you don't come with love. And being available is that you give full obedience to your purpose and destiny that God created in you to do. And what you say is, I want to love the way God loves the people. It's not about me being right or wrong or whatever. It's about me loving well. And when I love well, that's when I change the atmosphere. When I love well, there's an open heaven. When I love well, that's when people get influenced. Because love is the answer. That's why God so loved the world. It wasn't God so much knew about himself, God and now. It says God so loved the world. The only way we can be actually influenced in this world is when we start loving people the way God loves. How do we love him? When we get to know him better. When we get out the secrets of the kingdom of God. What they've been given to us. When we know those things, that's when we're absolutely amazing. And that's where everything changes. I want us to walk counting the cost into that direction. I want us to really become people that understand that the enemy is standing there beside Joshua and he's accusing him left and right and God says, no. The Lord rebuke you. Start finding the places in your life where you partner with the enemy. Start finding the places where you started being judgmental about people, about different churches, about ministries, about whatever else. When you start having a judgment start asking God for forgiveness for that. Because when you ask Him for forgiveness, your river is going to start flowing. And people are going to notice what you're saying is actually because you believe it, not because it's intellectual. And it becomes a life. And it changes people's life around them. Amen? Father, I declare right now in Jesus' name that you would take the words that are spoken today. And Father, I pray for those who are really touched by your message, Father, that they would um, actually in, be inspired beyond just knowledge, but open their hearts and give their hearts permission to receive the message. And then, Father, close the heart up and let you start doing the cleaning house. And, Father, that throughout the night, dreams and visions, throughout the day, Father, there'd be start things coming up that you would show them where judgment is. We, we, you would show us where of forgiveness needs to be. You show us where availability needs to be. And Father, we would encounter the highways and byways, by, highways and byways of the Lord to bring the kingdom of God to earth in Jesus' name. Amen.